Hello everyone, welcome to a second talk on linguistic bodies. In this talk, we will try to apply some of the ideas we presented in the first talk to issues of language development, autism, and questions concerning language as we know it in terms of grammar, symbol, and gestures. Again, you will hear the three authors speaking. I will try to first give you some recap of what we have said yesterday. We are concerned with the question of how we live as linguistic bodies. We had used an inactive uh, logic and an inactive perspective in developing a series of categories that move from established inactive concepts into the idea of linguistic bodies. And for that, we have presented the dialectical model where we have unpacked some of the forms of acts and agency that are subsumed every time we participate in language and that they are difficult to distinguish and unpack in other ways. We have summarized the idea of linguistic bodies as autonomous agencies that are constituted by the braided flows of self and other direct utterances, and that linguistic bodies are always navigating tensions between the incorporation of utterances and the incarnation of agencies that are entailed in the person constituting powers of those utterances voices, styles, opinions, and so on. So how do we become linguistic bodies? This is typically understood as a question of language acquisition, but here uh, we're going to try to just give you some thoughts about the methodological uh, concerns that are involved when you take the perspective that we are presented. We could try to put together some of these concepts, and we have done so in the past, in some sort of relation. So we have linguistic bodies, as this tension between incarnation and corporation. They live in a life world of and language environments and social interactions. And on these are mediated by forms of participatory sense-making, many of which, but not all of them, are languaging. The problem with this static model is precisely that, that it is a static model even though it can be informative, it still lacks what we think is essential to understanding where we are positioned when we're trying to look at the question of language development. In fact, what we have to do is to try to capture uh, the complexities of real life first. This is not simply something that has to be added later. We believe that this is of the essence of why we are linguistic bodies in the first place. And we tend to think of language as something that is already out there, of course, and it is to some extent, but we think of it, it as something that is static. And here is worth recalling in the words of Valentin Voloshinov that language is not passed on like a ball that is tossed from generation to generation. It cannot properly be said to be handed down, it endures, but it endures as a continuous process of becoming. This is an issue that will be coming up again and again in these slides. Individuals do not receive a ready-made language at all, rather they enter upon the stream of verbal communication. And I highlight the point of this is a stream, this is a living, organic, moving, historical stream of activity. In short, the problem is that life is messy. We think that we have to approach this complexity by delimiting our situation to something such as this, an adult and a child uh, engage in some sort of play where words and linguistic gestures are learned. But while these situations may occur and do occur in real life, the, lots of other things also happen in real life. Life is complicated. There are all kinds of engagements in all kinds of uh, environments and all ages. Adults and children are creating themselves as linguistic bodies over and over again in ways that cannot simply be said to be extensions of this very simple situation. In the words of Edward Reed, the language learning child does exist in a complexly nested environment. But far from being noise which creates a problem for language learners, this sort of variations uh, in the way that language happens 
provide crucial information to the language learning child about the language, the way language is structured in the linguistic community. We try to summarize this idea with the concept of full linguistic engagement. This means that we are already always engaged from in language since birth and even before. Linguistic bodies develop in context of this full linguistic engagement. Adults adapt, simplify, emphasize, facilitate, and so on, the linguistic participation of infants, but these accommodations never amount to less than a full linguistic engagement once we consider that all that is contained in the simple act of addressing an utterance to the infant. The moment this act happens, infants are put in contact with the whole of language and place within the borders of a living linguistic community. Human history is brought into their lives. Just simply by addressing the infant in, 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 with a simple utterance, this is happening. Another issue that is brought into consideration here is that our development as linguistic bodies is a perpetual becoming. It never ends. Uh, and for this, it's useful to recall uh, some thoughts by Gilbert Simondon, because to become a linguistic body is a case of what he calls collective individuation. It is also a further move in the trends to neotenization that he identifies when we move from physical to organic to psychic individuation. We become persons by becoming linguistic bodies, whatever our capabilities, by means of participation in trans-individual patterns. And language opens up new potentialities due to its critical powers, but also new vulnerabilities, new ways in which things can go wrong. We must see human neoteny as a way of abiding in potentiality, or stretching its horizons in response to the creative power and world-transforming practices, but not by escaping its various sources of determination, but by holding them in abeyance, slowing them down, playing with them, and keeping options open as much as circumstances allow, rather than pointing to a cauldron where separate nature and culture meet and mix Neoteny draws our attention to nature's way of growing cultures and culture's way of producing nature. So the picture that is emerging is one of perpetual becoming. And this is in strong resonance with Paulo Freire's critical pedagogy. This pedagogy affirms men and women as being in the process of becoming, as unfinished, uncompleted beings, in and with a likewise unfinished reality. And this is where the, uh, the need for education is a human manifestation. And the unfinished character of human beings and the transcendental character of reality necessitate that education be an ongoing activity. And we highlight this, the question again, that we do not stop becoming linguistic bodies ever. Parents, while the child is learning, are also in the process of becoming linguistic bodies that are able to do parenting activities, for instance. So to sum up, because of the full linguistic engagement, children are never entirely pre-linguistic. The development of linguistic skills is not linear, not homogeneous, but strongly path-dependent. There are so many ways of becoming a linguistic body. The process involves learning to participate and navigate the tensions in all the stages of the model, and many other tensions as well. It is a person-constituting process. We become a linguistic body by becoming persons as well. And this process, by abiding in potentiality, remains forever unfinished. We never stop doing this. Becoming linguistic bodies is relatively robust, although it can break down in some cases. But human bodies that are able to engage in linguistic interactions should be considered linguistic bodies to a virtually equal degree. This does not mean that there may be differences in how we become linguistic bodies, and some of these differences, depending on our history and our cultural interests, may be worth looking into in more detail. And this is what we're going to do in the second part of the talk, where Hannah will talk about autistic linguistic bodies. Thank you, Ezekiel. Yes, before we start talking about autistic linguistic bodies, I would like to reiterate some of the issues about language and linguistic bodies that are important in this context. 
And these are that language is not an additional cognitive skill, but constitutes a novel kind of body, a linguistic body, and a novel kind of autonomy and agency, continually and variously entangled with the other bodies and the other autonomies and agencies. So languaging is a particular, all-encompassing way of participating in each other's sense-making for linguistic bodies. And linguistic bodies, as we've also just seen, are always becoming. And also, linguistic bodies always and fully participate. They bring all their bodies, the organic, sensory, motor, and intersubjective bodies and concerns and cares to a linguistic situation, and they do this together with others. So now, to go on to autistic linguistic bodies. Autistic people are all very different, and they all have social and communication difficulties or differences. And these language differences in autism are very wide-ranging and diverse. So, for instance, people with autism can have delayed development, some autistic people never speak, and some are at first non-verbal and then suddenly speak in full sentences. Some people also have literal understanding of language, they take things literally. Um, They also may have difficulty with metaphor or irony, they take directives to the letter, they have difficulty grasping the meaning of homonyms from the context, for example tear or tear, and they have difficulties in capturing the gist of a story, an image, and they also have difficulty understanding sentences with many subordinate clauses, or connecting meaning across several utterances. But at the same time, there are also people who defy all of this. For instance, one of my friends, and he is an um, adult diagnosed with autism as an adult, Jo Behoots, tweets in response to Peter Hobson's idea that people with autism like to think, or that autistic people think like computers, namely literal. Jo says, in response to this, fortunately, I lack both the imagination and the creativity to feel the sting of Hobson's argument on autism. And obviously, being ironic in this case. So, what to make of all this? How to make sense of this wide variety of autistic languaging? Well, We have to say that autistic people are full linguistic participants, like everybody, and autistic people are linguistic bodies, like everybody. They are just so in a particular way that goes with their autism. And this is, as we have seen, quite different for everybody with autism. So in the book we propose two hypotheses about autistic languaging, and these are just two hypotheses, we have to say. They can serve as templates for further hypotheses as well. So we have conjectured that autistic people either under or over-regulate social interactions, or do a bit of both, but they tend to overshoot their regulations of interactions in which they engage, and also that autistic people may braid utterances differently. And what I'm going to do now is explain these two hypotheses with a few examples. So first of all, take Lenny. Lenny is an autistic child in interaction with another autistic child, And they're playing together with a robot that moves itself and that says things like Hello, hello there. At some points in the interaction, Lenny makes utterances, that is, he performs linguistic acts that are considered echolalic. That is, they are supposedly meaningless repetitions of something that somebody else or the child himself has said before. What Lenny does is say things like Table has a T in it. This is felt as disruptive to the interaction. Now, what is going on here? Well, Penny Stribling and her colleagues investigating videos of this interaction with conversation analysis found that the spelling assertions that Lenny made always occurred at similar points in the interaction, namely when the other child was playing with the robot. And they also found that his assertions had a rising intonation, much like a protest. We could thus conjecture that Lenny was protesting the fact that the other child was playing with the robot, that he was attempting to gain control of the robot. He seems to have been asserting some of his own agency in the conversation as well, by saying something that he knows, making an assertion of his competency by giving these spelling assertions. But all this was not taken up in the interaction. 
His spelling assertions were felt as simply disruptive, and we think this is because he felt he had to regulate this interaction in which something happened that he was not happy with, and he did this by over-regulating the interaction. He tried to participate, in other words, in an interaction in which he felt left out, but he did so by actions and utterances that were not felt as attempts to participate in the moment by the other people in the room. And so this attempt at participating went wrong by a reaction to being, in fact, under-present in the interaction. And he reacted to this by trying to over-regulate it in a way that wasn't felt as appropriate, appropriate or understood as such by the other people that were present in the moment. So if we look at this using the model, the model of linguistic bodies, we see that what is going on here takes place at the level or at the stage of the regulator versus regulated role. So probably Lenny felt overregulated and reacted to that by becoming too much of a regulator and in ways that were not felt as appropriate. And so no dialogue and recognition took place in this case. So this is an illustration how we can use the model to look at instances of languaging between people and see what is going on there in terms of how they manage or not to participate. Now let's take the second example, um, according to which autistic people braid utterances differently. So full linguistic engagement means that we are continually dynamically enveloped in language and so are autistic people. As linguistic bodies, they move in and are flows of utterances, just like everyone else is. They just braid of utterances differently or follow and understand different braids in the web of utterances that we all move in. So look at a few examples. Here's Adam, a young child with autism who was taken out on a bicycle ride with his grandfather. And when he came home together with his grandfather, his grandmother started interrogating his grandfather because she thought it was dangerous to take out this little boy on a bike ride. She didn't like that. And even later, when Adam goes home to his parents and recounts the story, he's, he tells about the bike ride and about the interaction between his grandmother and his grandfather afterwards, where the grandmother was worried and interrogated the grandfather. He recounts this story to his parents and their reaction is, his mother says, she should have been a lawyer. She really should have been. She could have easily been a district attorney or a detective of some type, says his father. And Adam says to this, she finds things easily. So this is an example of braiding utterances differently in the sense that Adam picks up on something of what the parents are saying they are talking about the grandmother being a detective and Adam connects this with something that his grandmother is indeed good in. So she finds things easily. But he doesn't pick up on the amused criticism of the grandmother when they say that she could have been a lawyer or they are remarking on something of her affective style and of her um, expressive attitude in the sense that she is interrogating the grandfather and Adam hasn't really picked up on that strand of the interaction. For him it seems to be more of a pragmatic um, ongoing interaction rather than something that's expressive of something of his grandmother's style of interacting with the rest of the family. So here he picks up on threads of the of the conversation, not only this conversation but also the conversations that have been going on before and maybe he missed already some earlier threads and therefore cannot connect to them here as well. He interacts with some of what is going on, but not with everything that the other people in the interaction are also picking up. So this is the example of braiding utterances differently. But we also have another example here of another young boy with autism in interaction with his mother. His name is Aaron. And here the relevant um, expression that they are using is the one with the arrow in front of it on the slide and here Aaron says you're looking at the brick stove but he says this in a sing-song voice and I'll do the dialogue for you and then we'll interpret it so they are sitting around the kitchen table and Aaron says mm -mm, and he looks away from mum and mum says what are you thinking about 
Then Aaron turns farther away from mom towards the stove and mom says, uh oh. And Aaron sings, you're looking at the brick stove. And mom says, you're looking at the brick stove. We are not together. And Aaron sa turns immediately and rapidly back to her and mom says, oh, now we are together. And then Aaron turns away from mom again and then turns back and mom says, now we are together. Aaron turning away rapidly again. Mom says, uh oh. Aaron laughs and turns back toward mom and mom says, do you want to be together? Yes, says Aaron. So here, utterances are braided in a way that involve mother and Aaron in an interaction about being together. Literally, they say, they talk about wanting to be together and they indicate when they are together and when they are not and whether they want to be together and each of them participates in this fully. But what is interesting here is the, as I said, the sentence that is you're looking at the brick stove said in a sing-song voice, which is one another one of these echolalic utterances, these supposedly meaningless repetitions. And Aaron is doing these, he has, this is um, something that they do more often in the family. It's a kind of repeating dialogue. And what he is doing seems to be meaningless, but actually in this in this dialogue, we can see that very clearly it has meaning at several levels and that both of them fully participate in this. So autistic people can and, and like to engage in fatigue talk, in rough and tumble play, and with a flexible partner who recognizes this wish to connect and the capacity for playing with connection, both literally and figuratively, real participation is possible, also in complex linguistic ways. For instance, in other examples from the same papers, Aaron challenges requests for linguistic performance from his mother and, and delays responding to her request for saying something grammatically correct in a way that keeps them connected at the same time. So we see that lots of interesting things are going on in autistic languaging with a lot of rich detail about of what people with autism are capable of in language. So to sum up, Autistic people care about others, about connecting, about making sense together. They do want this, they just want it differently. And dealing with this requires caring and engaging and capable, interested co-participants and it requires an effort from everybody involved. So the environment, the linguistic world of the person and the ongoing search for their match is crucial. The match between the autistic person and their linguistic world. So the two hypotheses that we gave here, as I just said as well, are a kind of template for further research on autistic participation and autistic languaging using this linguistic bodies concept and the model. Autistic languaging is widely variable, but we can say that there is one general maxim for how to approach autistic languaging, and that is to strengthen participation if and when desired, we have to say, because indeed it's important to strengthen participation because what makes people fluent at participatory sense-making is precisely to engage in participatory sense-making, but this may also include sometimes disengaging from making sense together, disengaging from conversation and interaction, because this is also very important in well-being for everybody, but especially also for people with autism. Thank you. This is it about Autistic Linguistic Bodies. Now over to Elena. So hello again, everybody. We just had with Hannah some examples of languaging, of autistic languaging, um, of autistic linguistic bodies and non-autistic ling linguistic bodies languaging together. So now we have come to the place in the book where we talk about in chapter 11, uh, quote unquote, language as we know it. We couldn't start here because, well, for reasons that are hopefully fairly obvious by now, but we did not want to begin the project saying what language already is and then trying to explain how humans learn this or interact with it or generate it. Um, we wanted instead to be able to, by the time we spoke about the everyday, ordinary cases that we easily call languaging, um, have readers or uh, have listeners well acquainted with some of the moves and concerns that, that we have been using to give instead this inactive and participatory 
an ontological picture of world involvement and dialectics and agency and autonomy and, and the other pieces of the puzzle that allow us to approach this. In other words, to see inside of the language that we already know and use so well, all of these forces and all of these entanglements and start to be able to unpack those a little bit, which I will try to do or comment on a bit in this section. I should also say that the method of this chapter is to point out um, work all over that has been done in a kind of spirit that we find inactive and also to pose different questions um, that might come out of such work, but we do not yet have or offer a fully worked out inactive grammar. For example, these are notes towards that work that would have to follow from what we do here. So why am why do we use cognitive linguistics as a little bit of a foil yesterday and certainly in the section I'm about to, to talk about? And one reason is because we're, we're very sympathetic to and in certain ways grow out of that tradition and have this deep shared basic assumption that accounts of language should be rooted in what we know about cognition, including environment, shared knowledge, and embodiment. So two programmatic quotes from cognitive linguists about the field. Say, for example, cognitive linguistics sees language as embedded in the overall cognitive capacities of humans. And language is not an autonomous cognitive faculty. So, so far, so good. We're quite on the same page. But as it goes on, we start to see um, that a lot depends on vocabulary. And there are divergences here. For example, when we try to define what language is, not, not just what it's not. So um, Croft and Cruz in a very wonderful and useful textbook on cognitive linguistics say that language is fundamentally the real-time perception and production of a temporal sequence of discrete structured symbolic units. Whereas in the 2015 paper, we talk about languaging as a form of social agency that involves a double regulation of self and interaction that integrates the tensions inherent in dialogue, dialogical organization and participation genres. And as we've been saying all along, we think that this sort of dual approach at once approaching humans and language together as inseparable in a sense um, involves this messiness, this need, as I said yesterday, to take everything together to try to get into the always already and attend to bodily living, even in our linguistic analysis. So we start to see some differences here. Um, we can learn to see language as we know it from this different perspective, as a complex, as complex processes of sedimentation and spontaneity that have to be enacted in each case, rather than followed as rules. And that's sort of the mantra or the theme of this chapter and this section. We can see symbols as joint enactments that project new trajectories for collaborative sense making, as we'll talk about. And we can even see the acts of writing and reading texts as forms of participatory engagements, where our constitution as flows of utterances affords opening up to a text or to our narrator, just like it does another person. So I'll get into um, a few different different topics or subtopics here. I'll start with this cartoon though from Calvin and Hobbes, which shows braiding of utterances, reporting utterances, and the kind of material and situated and interactive aspects of grammar that our account would wish to highlight and is also a fun cartoon and kind of a classic. So Calvin has made a duplicator machine and says to Hobbes, okay Hobbes, press the button and duplicate me. Hobbes wonders if this is such a good idea, and Calvin, very, you know, indignant, insists that these stupid ethical questions are getting in the way of scientific advances, is what he says here, right? He's like, hit the button, will ya? And then Hobbes admits he'd hate to be accused of inhibiting scientific progress, so here he already is rephrasing or reporting Calvin's utterance. He says, here you go, presses the button, and inside... To make the duplicating noise, Calvin says, boink. And Hobbes says classically, scientific progress goes boink, which winds up actually, I think, being the title of one of the 
comic book collections of these strips. And um, Calvin and his duplicated self now have an argument about who invented the duplicator machine. So this moment in the comic where Hobbes says scientific progress goes boink, you know, folds together what has been said before, what he himself actually said before, which was already a recasting of what Calvin said, and now weaves in um, into his phrase the noise that Calvin made to <laughs> to um, enact the duplicating process that, that he is pretending. So fold this together and you get the phrase, the, the amusing punchline, especially when it's not so um, painfully deconstructed, is that scientific progress goes boink. Um, and this folding together of the noise, the enactment, and the context in the in the utterance uh, is not only where the humor comes from, but also is sort of the crux of the whole the whole meaning that they're making together. Although at this point, Calvin seems to have moved on and is a little bit oblivious about it. So here's a refresher again on utterance reporting and utterance braiding um, and the possibilities there. So in terms of talking about inactive grammar, um, a few points. Grammar as we know it is really important to the activity of reporting utterances. And we do want to remember that utterances need not be verbal, right? But so one story you could tell about the origin of grammatical conventions that we have is that they come about because we need to clarify what's going on in reported utterances, particularly in indirect speech. So an utterance reporting is a recursive operation whose object of transformation is another utterance, but this is, as we've seen, very contextual and can vary, and folks can vary in their skill and ability to do so, also as Hannah showed. So regulatory elements are needed to differentiate and establish the links between the reported and the reporting parts of the utterance. And again, part of the pressure and the model that gives rise to utterance reporting is a potential confusion about, um, you know, when one is trying to regulate themselves and one is trying to regulate an interaction, what is, um, what's going on, who's talking to whom, um, and we get on the same page by speaking about the same utterance together, but we need to clarify that we are now speaking about the utterance that just happened, and so all of these different layers can get clarified with different grammatical roles and pieces and parts. And we are inspired here um, by the work of Jacobson on the um, on categories and rules being derived from meta-relations. And this could be one motivation for grammar as a set of conventions. We want to emphasize our, or we would be looking for in an inactive account non-representational world involving and world relating know-how. Uh, so grammar is a is a skill and is something that we're able to do and enact together, um, not because of necessarily, you know, modules in the brain or innate abilities uh, in a direct way, but because of our environmental and social interactions and really rich scaffolding that happens there, which will be seen a bit when I talk about symbols just in a second. But we can talk about this. Um, as autonomous patterns in a community available for interactive regulation. So even the, um, the handshakes and the high fives that we saw in the dialectical model would be examples. And what we can see happening is an increasingly sedimented set of networked repertoires for, that are available for action um, and for social action. So you have a sedimented set of networked repertoires and as well um, these material histories of incorporation and incarnation. The fact that whenever we are arriving to make sense with another participant, our bodies are, are ready in a certain way for managing those open tensions and interactions. For, and the example that I already mentioned here um, from the model would be recursive use of partial acts, so acts starting to regulate or comment upon um, other acts locally, uh, suggesting their complement or strongly inviting a complement. And all of these pieces fitting together, kind of showing, showing what comes next, what needs to come next, um, are 
in our bodily practices of grammar or gra grammaticalizing, if you will. Now, the slogan that comes out of cognitive linguistics in this topic um, is that grammar is conceptualization. So what does that mean? I mean, quite a lot, again, hangs on the vocabulary. Um, it seems to us that grammar is action. Conceptualization, too, is action, I suppose. Rooted in sedimented and spontaneity um, dialectics. Sense-making is rooted in these material histories of incorporation and incarnation of handling and navigating that tension of making oneself one's own linguistic body, one's own flow of utterances, um, and also has to do with being dynamically responsive to intersubjectivity and participation in real moment-to-moment -moment situations through situational affordances. But we think even with this view that really stresses conceptualization as a material, social, extended sort of process, we can still get phenomena like objectivity and reference and ideality, which we also discuss um, in chapter eight as well as in this chapter of the book. So how this would work um, is, has sort of been said, I think, or suggested already, but social acts are about various things. When we're acting to regulate a uh, a dialogical situation or a confusion of genres or trying to move on in a conversation, um, our acts are about that tension or they might be about other acts, including utterances. An objectifying attitude emerges in this context via the practice of regulating other practices and experiences. And I think we talk here about objectivity in the book as something that is brought to shared awareness, action, or appreciation through that interactive sense-making, that participatory sense-making activity, right? So the objectivity in the sense of a noun really comes out of, it's like a process product thing. It comes out of whatever the objectifying attitude yields in that context, right? What is brought to our shared awareness, action, or appreciation and then collaborative and recursive acts of bringing to presence by um, the very activities having this inherent aboutness, the sense-making activities of linguistic bodies refer. And we see, see this, I think, potentially more clearly um, in talking about inactive symbols, which is where we'll go, go next. So here are two symbols. One, um, something you might see, well, from the instructions of a of an IKEA type store and furniture assembly, and it is meant to be immediately intelligible, just no matter what your linguistic background is, and I suppose also no matter what your comfort level with assembling flat package furniture is, um, which is something that we also think is grammatical in a very embodied way. But this symbol is meant to to communicate and care, kind of carry a lot within its simple form. And then we have another more political symbol, um, the which one could probably speak for a long time about the various layers of meaning here too as a knitted um, craftivism type materially made product. These hats meant to be in this shape and color, very, again, roughly sort of abstractly of a uterus, worn to the women's marches in 2017 following Trump's elections. Um, these hats function as solidarity, as identifying um, people coming together for a common cause, as a provocative response, and one could go on. So the question of, of an active symbols is important, again, because the account does not want to posit representations um, in, a, in at least not in a very literal way as mental entities waiting in a brain to be accessed or processed. Language is instead, we're trying to say, interactional, and it's an in-the-moment interactional achievement. Um, so even more abstract or symbolically mediated sense-making is, again, an interactional here and now enactment or achievement. And symbols help us. They're tools in doing this. They are themselves joint enactments 
and they are concrete, spontaneous, and embedded in repertoires of previous symbolizing. They're jointly used or created constraints, a la Joanna um, Rajajek Leonardi's use of Howard Pate's notion of a symbol as a replicable constraint on interaction dynamics. So symbols help organize the sense making in, the, in a given moment and time. These bring forth virtual flows into participatory sense making, similarly to how um, incarnating utterances brings in the influences or the voices or the perspectives of others. Symbols speak all, all at the same time of their past, of um, that which they are connected to via their symbolic representation. They're an object for joint discussion, argument, contestation, navigating. So they introduce um, different contexts, including micro contexts into participatory sense making. They're kind of like orienting or pivot points in this way. And they have so much power and so much built in temporality to aid sense making, um, in part because of their paradoxical persistence, their material instantiation allows these constraining effects to persist and to change as distances between sense makers grow. So for example, um, the example, one example could be a policeman's badge that co-constituted an act of authority in the past, but in some future point just symbolizes a social structure no longer in place. So at one time, you know, when you see the badge that someone wears or shows, it is an, it is an enactment of an authority relation and one has to submit to it, um, but later it could become a relic in a museum or something and only speak of that structure in retrospect. So we want to say that symbols are, as I said earlier, tools for linguistic bodies to grammaticalize, to organize and carve up and direct sense making um, at a given moment. And a really great example we find of this um, in some, in from within the cognitive linguistics tradition, although it's on the, I would say the, the vanguard of it is in this example of recurrent gesturing. So the work on recurrent gesturing comes out of Cornelia Mueller's lab and um, work that she's done there with colleagues towards a grammar of, of non-conventional conversational gesturing, which is a really interesting attempt that I'll talk more about why that we find that so fascinating in a second. So Silva Ladovic and Jana Bresam have discovered this um, cyclic gesture that recurs in communities of German speakers. They call this, quote, a possible repertoire of gestural forms um, or standardized gestural forms that are used recurrently. And this form shows up in predictable form context links with predictable variations in its morphophonemic features. So that means that it has this core movement, a continuous circular movement of the hand performed away from the body outward that allows it to be identified in different contexts and even coded by its articulatory features. Um, its features of, of location, of finger uh, positioning, hand shape, and movement are all consistent. So in a sample of 12 German participants that they observed in 10 hours of naturally occurring conversation, 56 cyclic gestures were identified in terms of these recurrent combinations of gesture parameters, and they found them to be used consistently in three different use contexts. So the fact that these kinds of gestures can be analyzed grammatically but still produced spontaneously is very interesting to us for its ability to demarcate a borderland between conventional or non-conventional, um, natural and non-natural. This is pretty consequential for standard work and gesture studies. On the one hand, even though these are um, co-speech gestures or conversational hand gestures, they don't have to be coded as a handmade into speech if they can be instead broken down in terms of their articulatory features, their visible physical characteristics that distribute systematically. And it's also significant for a field that has long wondered over the purpose and function of co-speech gesturing and has kept itself in a theoretical bind, on, on my view, as I've said in some other publications, by ruling out the conventionality and language like nature of hand gestures, for example, in the works of David McNeil or Faye Perel. 
recurrent gestures like iconic, metaphoric, emblematic, and other gestures are, we want to say, inactive symbols. They emerge from operations between bodies, interactions, and sedimented community practices, and they establish for participants micro-contexts of virtual flows and ideal images with attendant constraints and affordances. Recurrent gestures are more sedimented than other symbols, but this only means that they are identified, used, and responded to in certain ways rather than others. Their unique zone of partial sedimentation actually makes them a more ready example of inactive symbolizing, as we've been attempting to describe, than word use. As inactive symbols, recurrent gestures are neither fully open nor fully closed. They simply are likely to bring about one set of projective and regulatory effects on an interaction rather than another. So we can also compare um, possible explanations of this phenomena in our view as opposed to a cognitive grammar view. Ron Langacker would talk about, um, uh, or his work is used by uh, Ludwig and Bressam to talk about these, the grammaticality of recurrent gestures as being entrenched. That would make them a linguistic unit defined as, quote, an established pattern of activity, a complex neural event with a significant potential for recurrence. This is the entrenched aspect here. Rather than seeing recurrent gestures as located in individual minds, however, we are in a position to see the symbolic skills and sensitivities involved in recurrent gesturing as live events of incorporating and incarnating articulations available in and for a community. So what's available for enacting recurrent gestures could include neural patterns, but also muscular skeletal memory, interpersonal relations, spatial arrangements, activity schedules, artifacts, tools, instruments of labor, places, buildings, other environmental settings, and the meeting of all of these. On our view, expressive and referential functions like these arise as the result of bodily movements, which in the course of regulating and responding to interactive dynamics are always becoming articulate. There is no need to posit a careful accumulation of entities or representations like phonemes, words, or gestures in the brain if we want instead to attend to the symbolic skills and sensitivities that we have for acting with what is available. So that is an example of a different way of a different way of approaching symbol and grammar from the perspective that we've been sketching with linguistic bodies. And we hope to have more conversations about this um, shortly. So what we have touched on today are some applications from the third part of the book to language acquisition, autism, grammaticalizing, symbolizing, and gesturing, very briefly. Um, and what we have not had time to talk about are applications to reading and writing, truth processes. Uh, a little bit we have spoken about the vulnerabilities inherent in being a linguistic body, and, and we will speak about for one more second, but we also have more um, worked out accounts of microaggressions relating to institutional utterances and an ethics of participation that would come out of this work and that are featured in the 12th chapter of the book, the final chapter, Making Better Sense. The ethical dimension of acting in language is always present, sometimes as a horizon, sometimes as the focus of our linguistic experience. We feel that a choice of words in an email response may be too curt. We feel a tension in a conversation and may even be aware that uttering certain words could be catastrophic. We feel the double binds of trying to be honest, pragmatic, and caring for others. Languaging is never free from risk, and sometimes it can feel like walking a tightrope. And these experiences become entangled with organic and sensory motor bodies. Linguistic risks are felt as bodily tensions. They trigger emotional episodes and stress. And if systematically experienced, they may lead to serious disorders. The converse of this picture, which is also a specifically linguistic vulnerability, is that to live as a linguistic body is to accept that language has a hold on us, and we are partially open to its movements. Our behavior, our ideas, our intentions are in part the result of being exposed to the linguistic acts of others. These acts can go straight into our bodies in all their dimensions and in part orient and direct, even momentarily take possession of our affect and our agency. And this is part of what we mean by saying that um, everybody participates 
uh, in our account of the ethics of participation. Every bodily dimension is present in every act and moment of languaging. This issue of taking possession over our affect and agency can particularly be the case when existing asymmetries are at play. The voices of others find an echo chamber in the flow of self-directed utterances and may not be easily silenced. Since utterances are constitutive of the linguistic self and of relations to others, in these embodied resonances, words sometimes cause harm and other times remedy injury. And that is from Linguistic Bodies, page 314. And perhaps we'll have occasion to touch on some of these consequences as well. So thank you very much. We look forward to discussion now.